and we're going live. And we are live. We it think looks like we're live. We think we we're are live. the debut show of uh, Chuck and Dunk. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> here on here, January twenty eighth, or is this the seventh? I think it's the twenty seventh. I'm pretty sure. Uh, Six p.m. Eastern time, and uh, Charlie Reinders. Uh, we'll get to you in a second. But my name's Duncan Fremlin. I'm a uh, banjo player and, uh, with a band called Whiskey Jack, uh, Stomp and Tom show, and uh, I also uh, I've written a book about Stomp and Tom, and. Um, I do a lot of streaming shows, etc. But I also play my band Whiskey Jack now, and it's forty-fifth uh, uh, year. It's a big number. Wow. Uh, also, my partner here is uh, Charlie Reinders. Charlie. Hey, Duncan. Yeah, I'm Charlie Reindress. I'm an actor, writer, director. I've worked in theater primarily for about 30 years here on the East Coast of Canada. And then I had written a play about Rita McNeil. So a publisher asked me if I would write a book about Rita McNeil, which I did. And then he asked me after that, they asked me to write a book about Stomp and Tom. And I tracked down Duncan and I interviewed you for the book. You told me some stories. And then when the book came out, we did some more interviews and you and I have just kept talking and we've never met because of COVID. Like we were supposed to do a tour of Ontario, but we've never actually met. But then you said, hey, we seem to have a rapport. Let's do a show. Let's do a show. And as it turns out, uh, since we're authors and uh, we have some friends that have recently written books and we are tonight uh, just thr thrilled to have uh, one of the great legends. Uh, uh, I'm going to bring him on the screen, say a okay. quick hello. And then then I have an intro that I want to play or uh, an introduction that I want to play for him so he can hear it, too. And then we'll get to the we'll get to the chat. It, his name is Brian McFarlane, and he is now in Stouffville, Ontario, has joined the, the chat. Brian, how, how, good day to you. Uh, thank you, Duncan and Charlie. Good to be with you. We, uh, we're going to have a good time, I think. We are. We are. Yeah. I, have an I have a couple of introductions, so if you just bear with me, I'm going to play one, and uh, hopefully it'll, it'll come through okay, but it's one that we, I'm sure you've heard before. I was delighted to learn that one of my constituents in Markham Stovall, Brian McFarlane, has been appointed to the Order of Canada, one of our country's highest civilian honours, for his contributions to the sport of hockey as a sportscaster, writer and historian. Brian McFarlane has had a distinguished career. Born in New Liscard, Ontario, he attended university on a hockey scholarship where he scored record numbers of goals. After graduation, he worked in television and radio, including CFTO and CFRB in Toronto. One of the most recognizable voices in the game for 26 years, he served as a host and commentator on Hockey Night in Canada, and he's written over 90 books on hockey, and in 1995, he was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. I want to extend my congratulations to Mr. McFarlane and to thank him for all he's done for Canadians and for Canada's game. Very nice, very nice, Brian, except there's over 100 books now, as we know. We will talk about that in a second. But if you just bear with me, I have another introduction that I found in your book that I thought might add some fuel to our conversation tonight, if you don't mind. Just a little bit. I'm, I'm reading from your book, Brian, which is very good, by the way. I love it. Uh, I, I was there not for all of it, but for some of it. So you say, uh, how did I come to be here in this place? A slight pain in my groin that I suspect may be cancer. Two stents, a pacemaker, a few concussions, th three knee operations, another hip replacement completed, four shots of insulin daily, and now this diagnos diagnosis of spinal stenosis and a tremor in my left hand, which influences my new career, painting in acrylics. I'm a lefty. Brian, I can't tell you how grateful we are. <laughs> that you are here tonight. <laughs> I didn't get around to my mental problems. <laughs> well, we'll discover those uh, throughout, throughout the show tonight. So, Duncan, I think you can make our pick. Oh, no, we're good now. I was going to say you can. We we're missing a little bit of Brian's head. But anyway, Brian, uh, Brian, I just wanted to say hi, because I've never met you. You and Duncan have hung out together, and yeah. I've never met you. However, my father is 75 years old and a lifetime Leafs fan, but never misses hockey night in Canada. I'm 55. And as a child, I would go to sleep to the sound of a hockey game. Like I still hear a hockey game in the background and I feel like it's time to go to bed for me because that was my childhood. So I'm sure your voice put me to sleep many nights as a kid. <laughs> well, probably Charlie, where, where are you from originally? I'm from Amherst, Nova Scotia. Okay, I love yeah. the Maritimes. 
Oh, well, yeah. I, I was talking to my dad earlier and he said, you're both welcome to come to the cottage anytime if you make it to Amherst, Nova Scotia. So there you go. Well, <laughs> we, sh we should plan to do that. Yeah. <laughs> That would be really... so, Brian. You've been a hockey player, as we heard in that intro. Hockey player, a broadcaster. You've written over a hundred books, and you're a painter. So I know we could probably talk to you. Like, just you just pick up the book, and anywhere you open it, it's like, oh, that's a story he could tell us for ten or fifteen minutes. So we're going to try to keep it to an hour. But because you two already know each other, and I don't know you, I just want how did you two meet? What's the story of Brian and Duncan? How do you guys get to know each other? Well, I'll we'll let Duncan there. tell that. Yeah, it was a it was a feature article in the Toronto Star uh, shortly after I published my book, which must have been maybe three, three and a half years ago now. And uh, in the article, it talked about Brian McFarlane, the artist, and they featured this painting back here, by the way, that, that, that's a Brian McFarlane okay. original. Uh, and so and, and, and he seemed in the article like this is a friendly guy. I've been watching him on TV for you know most of my adult life, and and I thought I'll just draft him a, a letter. And I got online, found his website, drafted him, and drafted him. I was just reading your reply today, Brian, actually to you to my email, and it was very friendly. And next thing you know, because um, I thought as as a as a new author, it would help for me to know other offers, uh, authors. And uh, so Brian's been very good. He's helped me with, on video and and whatnot, promote my book and stuff. And we, we meet fairly often for a coffee and, and are the couples, the two couples have gone out for, for lunch and stuff. So it's very, very nice. Oh, wow. Yeah. We'd do it more often if we hadn't had this damn pandemic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've enjoyed meeting you, Dunk. And uh, I was a Stompin' Tom fan and I'm a country music fan. I used, I think I'm the only announcer ever on CFRB that had an hour of country music on Saturday afternoons. Bill Anderson, if you recall, Bill Anderson, who is now on the Zoomer station in the classical station, back in, I think, the 70s and eight, or late 70s and early 80s, Brian, I think he had a syndicated country show that was, that was, that was taped in CFRB studios, which is hard to believe when you think about it today. But it went to stations across the country. But otherwise, you're it, man. Oh, I, did, I, did, I didn't know that about Bill. I know that name. Um, I, I just, uh, in 1960, had to fill in with a couple of hours of disc jockey on Saturday afternoons. And I was called away to work for CBS to do their game of the week back then because I could skate. So... Um, I, I just let whoever subbed for me, I said, I've been playing country music on here and it's sponsored, but um, if, if you want to play something else, you can do that. Well, he didn't play country music. And I guess there were so many complaints that I, I can remember coming in Monday morning and I was standing in the urinal in, in the men's room when my <laughs> boss walked in and he gave me hell. He said, from now on, you tape that show before you leave for CBS games. <laughs> and make sure that it's country music for God's sake. He didn't like country music, but he he, he liked the sponsorship, I guess. Wow. And where was that radio station? You were traveling down to CFRB were... in Toronto. It's okay. And yeah. you were traveling from Toronto to the United States. Oh, I was going to New York, Chicago, but wherever the uh, NHL played their game of the week back then. Wow. Um, it it lasted eleven games from Christmas or from New Year's on. And um, it got me started. I'd, I'd lost an audition with Hockey Night in Canada. They told me I was too young. Now everybody tells me I'm too old. But um, <laughs> um, I was lucky because CBS wanted a guy who could skate, and I'd just finished my college hockey career. And the announcer from Boston had seen me play, I guess, in Boston or in, at Harvard maybe. And um, he recommended me because um, they wanted somebody who could have gone on the ice with Gordie Howe or Bobby Hull. My first guest was Red Kelly, and I'm sure he took me out of the play or showed me how he would body check somebody coming in or steer him gently toward the boards, which he did me that day. Um, <laughs> it wasn't authentic hockey, but uh, it got the fundamentals across to uh, all the U.S. Uh, folks, the, the viewers who probably didn't know a whole lot about the game now. 
Yeah. Yeah, actually, Duncan, there's a button at the bottom that you can touch so that we are all three on screen, but not quite so close because we're missing about half of Brian's head right well, now. I can move. There there. There. Oh, there. there he that works. Okay, that works too. I just didn't wasn't seeing all of you, Brian. Um, I was going to ask about that. So I'm going back just a little bit. But you went in 1952, I believe you got a ho hockey scholarship to study in the United States or 51, I guess. But yeah. hockey was fairly new at that. Like it wasn't as popular there. So was it a big deal that you were? It, it was a big deal because the university had never had a, a competing team. It had a like a fun for for all type uh, uh, environment at that time. So they were starting a big program and going into the uh, ECAC and the NCAA. And uh, we had played a game there with the junior club I played on. And by the way, we played down in Halifax that year and beat the Maritime champs. And then we beat uh, the Northern Ontario champs. And then we went into Jean Beliveau and the Quebec Citadels, and they beat us rather badly. Uh -huh. And I had the measles in them. Can you imagine the biggest game in a series of your oh, life and you come down with the measles? Oh, so and sorry. I had to get out of bed and check Jean Beliveau before 12,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I guess I'll never make the NHL after playing against wow. him. But anyway, it turned my life around because I was a failing high school student, Charlie. I don't have a degree. My sister says, you must have one. And I said, I don't think I do anywhere. I don't think they ever gave me one. But really? the university took a chance on me. I can remember him saying, well, we, we, we feel good about you, so we're going to take a chance and bring you in down here. And my whole life just completely changed. Uh, there, there were the hockey games and the scoring records I set, but I didn't even know I was setting records because nobody had set any ahead of me. And, uh, <laughs> and I got to be class president. I brought my sister down, and she became vice president. Imagine two kids from Ottawa going to a U.S. college and becoming leaders. And I brought some friends down from the neighborhood and they became very good players. And uh, one of them became a millionaire in the oil business when he graduated. The other became a world-class magician. They're both deceased now. Uh, so, and Bill Torrey was a teammate of mine and a friend, and he went on to win four Stanley Cups mm -hmm. with the Islanders. So wow. um, it, it, it was a great experience. I met my wife-to-be the very first day of school. And we're still together after 65 years. Yeah. And yeah. That, that worked out all right. I yeah. sent my daughters down there to college and they both graduated. And so the, the university experience was just amazing. And uh, can I'll I never, ask, Brian, never okay. forget it. Yeah. Can I ask if, uh, first of all, university, you must have had to go to some classes. You've become, yes. you've become an accomplished author. I know you come from... Uh, a family of accomplished authors. So I'm curious, what courses did you take when you weren't uh, well, I would... being a big star? And did it contribute <laughs> to your ability to write so well in your following years? Well, obviously, I avoided the math classes, but I took Eng <laughs> I was an English major. And uh, I took things like criminology and sociology and, uh, of course, English. Um, Who is oh, your favorite there... classic? Well, the, the, I had no idea I'd become an author because my dad was the writer in the family. He'd authored the Hardy Boys books. I don't know whether you knew that, Charlie. Yeah. And uh, he he kept that a hidden secret till uh, he was middle-aged. And then he finally confessed that he was the original author of the Hardy Boys books. And they paid him $100 a book flat fee instead of royalties. He got nothing. $100. Otherwise, uh, we never we never owned a car, never owned a house, but one penny a book on those Hardy Boys, and we would have been quite wealthy. Uh, oh, but that God. never happened. He didn't seem to care. He said, "I knew what the deal was. If I hadn't written the damn book, somebody else would have." So wow. I just wanted to write one book in my life to prove to my dad I could write a book. My sister's a very skilled writer. Oh, about nineteen books, I guess now. Wow. And I talked to her today. She's 89 years old and uh, still writing. And I'm still writing. Um, where did this come from? Brian, where did it like it's not just be you, you just can't be 
your, you know, your dad's son and be a great writer. Somewhere along the line, you crafted a, a good sentence and you turned that into a good book and you turned that into a, a hundred books. And like, where, where does this, is it public school you learned? I, I remember in public school, they would teach you how to analyze the sentence so that you spoke well at the, and you knew why you spoke well. But where did this come from? Well, I don't know, Duncan, but I, you mentioned public school. They used to have spelling bees, and I was always the third best in the class. And I miss, can you imagine me remembering today a spelling bee where I misspelled the word knee, K-N-E-E. -E. It baffled me, and I, I came third that day in the spelling bee. Have you got and some new here I am, I st I'm still mad at myself for being so <laughs> stupid, you know, and misspelling <laughs> that word. Uh, but we got good fundamental teaching in, in those schools. Every Canadian did, I think. Um, and, and I never feel that I'm a good writer. I look at other writers and I say, oh my gosh, I wish I could write like that. In fact, I, I found one on the internet today um, well, it's a long story, but it's about uh, indigenous people in Canada and how this chief uh, went to a residential school, can you imagine, and got a good enough education that he was offered a college scholarship, and he went on to write some of the most marvelous stories of the Old West. I'm trying to write a book called the Canada's Wild Wild West, and he's in it. Uh, wow. I so admired his writing. He committed suicide in Hollywood when he was a young man, but he had an amazing life. And and I just said to my wife today at lunch, how could a fellow go to a residential school when he doesn't know whether he's white or black or or perhaps colored? He he was mystified by his background and and he wrote these amazing stories, which you can look up on McLean's magazine, by the way. Um uh, I can't think of his name now. It's a it's a long name. Um, uh, Child Buffalo, May Big Lance, or something of that nature. Um, but but uh, you can look up those Wild West stories, and they're just enjoyable. And I'm trying to revive some of them and put them in a book. If you that's great. If you send us the name, maybe Duncan, we can share it online, and people could look it up later. If you send it later, um, okay. But you've touched on about 18 different things that I want to ask you about. So first of all, I know Duncan has a picture of you on the cover of the NCAA magazine as a hockey player. Do you have that there, Duncan? I am, we'll but I was just sorry. I'm distracted. I'm just I'm okay. Go ahead. I'll, right. I'll find it. I'll find it. You find that. And then I was going to say, um, I was talking, my father and father-in-law are both big Leafs fans and they love hockey. And so I was talking to them tonight, or uh, my uh, wife was talking to her dad and he was saying, and I know your father's kind of best known for the Hardy Boys thing now, but he was saying that your father's hockey fiction meant a huge deal to him when he was growing up. He loved your father's hockey stories. Well, you can find them in McLean's too, but going back to the 30s. Uh, okay. Kelsey skates again, uh, McGonagall scores. Um, he had one in there that the, go the goalie was a deaf person, a deaf mute. So he didn't hear the crowd riding him and criticizing him. And he was able to tune all that out and win the big game. Uh, I'm trying to bring some of those back as well. I, I did have a couple of my dad's books published by Stoddard many years ago, uh, but they weren't that successful. But I think okay. now, with all this interest in history um, and some of the excitement of hockey in fiction, most publishers don't like hockey fiction. I've got a novel I haven't been able to peddle to any publisher. They don't even want to look at it. They say, a novel, hockey fiction? No, that'll never sell. Uh, I think it might someday, or I might even self-publish it. Yeah. Um, but, we, um, saw you, we saw you on the screen there as a young man <laughs> for a second. You were like 20-something there. <laughs> I'm assuming yeah, the 55. I, I wish I had more time left because uh, I'd like to revive some of my dad's old hockey fiction. I, I've discovered some of his adventure stories, his mining articles in McLean's. There must be 25 that I've listed, and I'm yeah. putting them away either to um, store at McMaster University with all my stuff or at least pass along to my grandkids or my great-grandkids. I've got four of them now. 
And they'll, they'll be in charge of the family records and memorabilia and all of that stuff. Because they have been published. There have been a couple of hardcover volumes, haven't there? I think I saw a volume two yes. of the story somewhere. Yeah. Yes. Um, just I, I want to touch base. I'll let Duncan talk here again in a second. But you were saying how people aren't interested in hockey fiction. I'm a, I, I mentioned that I've worked primarily in theater. Well, I, with a good friend of mine, we've written a few musicals together. And we wrote a musical about hockey. And mm -hmm. I discovered that people who like hockey, don't care for musicals and people who like musicals don't like hockey it didn't work yeah. it's what it was done at theater orangeville in ontario at one point but it's my least attend most poorly attended show i've ever written <laughs> well, I'd, charlie i'd like you to meet my daughter brenda who's out in new mexico now she's a wonderfully uh, skilled uh, theater director she went to oh. tulane to get her masters in theater arts she's won awards in the fringe in toronto she did a. She even took one of her shows to an off Broadway site, and for a week or two, tried to make a go of it on off Broadway. Uh, but I admired her uh, guts to do something like that. And uh, <laughs> she's now got an in uh, an in an internet business in lotions and that sort of deodorants and things. But she's she should be in the theater. And even wow. in the small town she lives in, she was directing a theater and she picked a, a, a beautiful Mexican girl to be the star. And of course, the uh, other people in town were a little resentful because their daughter didn't get the lead and she handed it to this Mexican girl. And uh, my daughter had never run into uh, racism or, or that sort of thing, but she sure learned quickly that... Uh, they wanted uh, certain individuals starring on the stage, no, no matter whether they had the talent to do that or oh. not. Oh, that's too unfortunate. Bad. Yeah, you, you live I, through. I will look her up. You you live through the, uh, I don't know, and so I guess from the from the racism point of view, it must have been the dark years of the of the NHL, the dark years of professional sports, uh, 50s, 60s. Well, right up until today, I'm sure you've seen some awful things and. I'm not going to ask you to talk about them, but uh, you have mentioned just in our casual conversations, having a coffee at Tim Hortons that, uh, you know, there have been some of the misogyny that was going on, just the old boys club and the, oh, yes. you know, just a, a whole different, different climate of, of people. And I, I realized as you were talking that at some point in time, as a young boy watching these broadcasts, uh, these CBC broadcasts, it went from, non-hockey people, Ward Cornell, I assume as a non-hockey person, uh, went from non-hockey people gradually to people that not just knew about hockey, but had played hockey. They were a bigger part. So was that a gradual thing or did somebody at Hockey Night in Canada just have this, the light went off and said, this is crazy. We got to have people that actually know what they're talking about. Uh, yeah, it was a gradual thing. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it was a gradual thing. Um, there were so many do's and don'ts when I started. Um, my voice is going today. It's been pretty good lately. But um, I was told to speak three times a period as the color commentator. That would be a good balance between me and Bill Hewitt. I said, what if six goals are scored? <laughs> and, and my boss said, well, talk about three of them. Oh, I wow. said, this is this is my first day on the job, and this, this is the rule. And then it was, don't ever talk when Bill is speaking. Um, always wait for the whistle, and there's a face-off. Well, they don't do that today. Um, don't get Ballard mad. Well, that was pretty hard not to do. <laughs> um, and don't talk about the fights. Well, they didn't know how to deal with fights back then. They wouldn't even put the camera on them initially, but they gradually learned how to deal with fighting. I mean, it is part of the game. If not, why don't they take it out? But um, all of those things were part of the growing up of hockey night in Canada. And uh, I was frustrated quite often because I wasn't supposed to say more than six things or f three things per period. <laughs> I broke that idiot, I'm sure, in my very first broadcast. <laughs> um, 
and some other rules, I guess, I broke along the way. Getting Ballard mad was one that I did almost every night, I think, because he finally turfed me from the building, and I had to go to Winnipeg to work for four years, and then Montreal for four years, which wasn't too bad. They were winning. Well, that's a badge and, of honor, isn't it, Brian? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> except, except, Duncan, you would think everything at the Forum was run first class, that was the worst studio I've ever worked with in my life. The intermission studio at the Montreal Forum. First of all, it was just chock full of smoke. Ten guys all puffing away, chain smoking. And I put a defaust a fume sign up on a pillar one day because my eyes were watering when I was on camera. And they gave me a hard time for that. And if I had Cherry in there and he got angry with them and told somebody to get out, was he because he'd slammed the door and disrupted Cherry and Cherry doesn't like disruptions. He'd say, get the F out of here and he'd kick him out. Well, then I'm guilty by association for the rest of the telecast. Well, that's Cherry's <laughs> friend. Don't don't cooperate with him. Um, I'd say, quick, get me a guest. Um, um, get me um, um, Guy Lafleur. He just scored the winning. And they'd they calmly put their smoke down somewhere in an ashtray, butt it, and then casually walked toward the door. And I said, my God, he won't be back for 10 minutes. And he probably won't <laughs> have Lafleur with him. And I need him right now. Uh, so that was what I ran into there. And they'd be angry with me if they heard this because they thought those people in the studio, they were the greatest technicians and floor directors and cameramen in the world. And I guess they were told that from time to time, but I didn't find them that way. I found the NBC guys, the the, AB, the CBS guys, uh, the Hamilton guys were, were so eager to do a good job. They did a better job than the Montreal crew. Was the I, ha I haven't said that very often. <laughs> what was the transition to American TV? Uh, you were you were in the forefront of this, weren't you? You were. Uh, were you the first one, really, the first Canadian to go down and try to teach America how to play hockey or what hockey was all about? Were you responsible for that glowing puck, Brian? Is that no, your idea? No, I, I hated, I hated that. Oh, but we I was, all hated that. I hated that. I, I'm responsible for Peter Puck in a way, though, because I helped create him in Hollywood one day and uh, one year for NBC. He wasn't created for Hockey Night. There's Peter Puck. There he uh, is. And uh, yeah, he's he's been a part of my life for almost 50 years now. And I have the worldwide rights to Peter. At least I might have. I don't know anymore because I haven't looked up any of those contracts. Uh, but I found when I paid a lot of money, I don't mind telling you. Well, I do sort of. Uh, anyway, 50,000 bucks for the Canadian rights and uh, more for the worldwide wide rights. But. I found everybody stole Peter Puck. I mean, everybody just put them on their internet sites and they sold t-shirts and books and whatever. And what, how am I going to police that? Because Hanna-Barbera, who claimed they owned the rights, uh, said, we don't take any responsibility for policing the, the, uh, the character. Uh, that's up to you. Well, it would have cost me a million dollars in legal bills to chase after these people who were selling Peter Puck everything. So that wow. didn't work out too well. But I don't regret it because Peter survived a, a, about 30 more years than he might have if I hadn't been in there to guide him along. <laughs> well, and, and he, you you wrote three books, didn't you, for Peter? Yeah. yeah I think we, we have pictures we, of a couple of those. Yeah, um, had, and a Peter Puck song. We had a song in the books. And Peter in costume was always a big thing at fall fairs at the CNE. Wow. Uh, we took him almost everywhere. And one day we went to Peter to some small town in mid Ontario and we had the Hart trophy with us and the lady Bing trophy and Peter Puck. And we're staying in a grubby motel overnight. And I said to my wife, we better put all of these things in bed with us because the Hart trophy is priceless. It can't be replaced. <laughs> and, and how they ever, the hall of fame allowed us to do that was just incredible. 
<laughs> so you slept with the trophies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a good story in and of itself. I think they were in the next bed, but <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Well, I was just thinking, Duncan and Brian, if you own the rights to Peter Puck and I can write plays and Duncan can write music, we could do a musical about Peter Puck. There we go. Take there it around. And, and I know what rhymes with Puck. This is going to be easy. Yeah, <laughs> I was, okay. I, I was thinking for kids. Maybe not. <laughs> oh. Uh, anyway, that's that's history now. But it, I got I had lunch with two really smart men a, a month ago, um, and uh, they want to revive Peter Puck. And I wow. said, "Go ahead, I'm I'm all for it." And uh, wow. they sent me a nice email just this week saying we're st still working on sponsors and working on a plan, a program, which you have to have to bring anything yeah. back today. So He's Brian, oh, when, sorry. I was just... when when the CBC makes the Brian McFarlane show, the movie of Brian McFarlane's life, you know, uh, who's going to play you? Who's going to who's the who's going to be Brian McFarlane? Is there an actor that you see that could do a good well, job? Well, I, I would think Paul Newman if he was still alive. Uh, <laughs> okay, still the alive. actor has to be alive, right? So because <laughs> he he was a skater, he was a player. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Did you like Face Off, by the way? Yeah, uh, <laughs> crazy. I think my my father's favorite movie ever, I think, is Slapshot. Have you guys seen? Sorry, that Slapshot. One? That's what I mean. Slapshot. That is the you, one. You I know meant. you Slapshot. meant Slapshot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a I had a friend who was in that, um, Danny Belial. Uh, he was a big league player, and he was with the uh, team at that time. And they when they had the movie, they wanted extras, so he volunteered. And when there was a fight. He volunteered to fight with Newman, and he says, "I'm down on my back, and Newman's throwing soft punches at me." And he's, every woman in the audience was saying, "I'd love to be out there playing in that role." <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, I just wanted to say about Peter Puck; he's still very popular. Like I was writing to my siblings today, saying we were doing this interview, and my sister was like, "Oh, my son grew up on those Peter Puck DVDs," and I was mentioning it to my daughter's boyfriend, and he was like, "Oh, I have a Peter Puck T-shirt," so it's still very popular. I will say, when you were talking about like trying to keep track of the rights, since Stomp and Tom is kind of what brought us all together, Stomp and Tom sued everybody for like Bud the Spud and it, Big Joe Muffera. So you kind of do have to be out there just suing people all the time, I think. Uh, I should have got a better lawyer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so Duncan, but, did you want to ask, I was going to, I have another yeah. question, but if you want to go next, Duncan. Well, it, it's the books. They really, uh, the, 100, 100 and what, 102? No, I, I don't think I'm, I don't really know Duncan, I don't look after those things, but somebody's got a list of okay. books. There's a I, lot. I, I think it's in the 95 area now okay. or six. Uh, I've got 10 books in my computer that I think are, are pretty damn good. They're for kids, adventure stories for kids. Uh, the one-handed hockey player, the boy has had his hand disfigured because he was figure skating and somebody stepped and they need him as a penalty killer. So he comes into the game and excels with his skating um yeah i've got a i've got a good book called go donna and it stems from my high school days i was coaching a girls hockey team at age 16 and donna monroe was one of our cute little red-headed forwards and we didn't score a goal in the two game season we had but we scored one on our own goalie donna got <laughs> rattled at center ice and knocked around Ooh. She went the wrong way, Ooh. and she she was so devastated. She went in the dressing room. She cried her eyes out. She said, "I'll never go back to Glebe Collegiate again as long as I live." And and she, here at age she's ninety years old now, and we're email pals now after a eighty year absence. And wow. uh, and she told me that story, and it made sense. And uh, I have uh, that for young women playing the game. That's a good book. Um, I've got one called Too Good for the Game, and it's about a kid like Gretzky who's so good in his own community that there's a lot of resentment, and he has a lot of obstacles to overcome before he can get on with his maturity and get on with a good team, with a good coach. Um, I think there are lessons in those books. Wow. Uh, and was, that always part, was that always important, Brian? Uh, having well, I think it books. is. Yes, I think it's good to leave a lesson if you can. 
Did you um, go into each book with that in mind? Like, did you, or did it? I'm just uh, curious of your process because as yeah, a struggling pretty. author myself, you know, we're all, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying, you know, it's difficult to sit down, have an idea, formulate it, uh, create a story that will appeal to a broad audience, have it, have the story make sense. I mean, it all sounds logical and everything until you sit down and actually try to do it. And you yeah. appreciate how difficult it is. And, re, you know, you might put your you may put your skills down as an author, but I've read many of your books and they you tell a good story, man. You just tell a good story. So, well, I, you know, I'm interested in that. There's lots more of them, but um, <laughs> uh, time's running out. I know that uh, I say I even, I've, I've got a new motto. I've either got 10 minutes or 10 years. And uh, <laughs> I hope it's the latter, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm losing too many friends these days. It's uh, it's hurtful. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I don't know honestly. You're the when I looked at when I started doing research on your entire career and you know the painting and the broadcasting and stuff. If you had only written the books, that would be overwhelming. I've written three books and each one. Well, I'm working on my third. My books take me three years to write. I don't know how you write a hundred books and have a life in addition. Like it blows <laughs> my mind. I don't know either, but I do work quickly whether i'm painting i've got a hundred paintings right behind me here i'll never sell uh, but i'll fix them up as best i can in the time that i have left and uh, i've got lots of relatives and lots of friends so we'll we'll see you may uh, have 10 have, years betty white lasted to 100 you may you might have 10 years left so you got lots to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah what are you saying duncan you want a painting no he was just saying he has lots of friends i just wanted to raise my hand and make sure that I'm on this list, you know, okay, 100 paintings, man. Someone's got to take those paintings. I've got just got the one. You've been one of my best customers, so I'm give, I'm telling you right now, next time you're here, you you can pick, pick one of 12 and go is, off with it. Is Joan there, Brian? No charge. Is, she, is Joan listening? No, the door's closed. She doesn't you, know I'm... Can you turn up the volume so she hears this? <laughs> Um, can, uh, the, she might say, don't give them away. She's yeah. always uh, telling me things like that, but I don't listen. Uh, I wanted to, okay. Um, the, we can talk about the books. I, I don't even know. Like we're, you know, we were going to try to keep it to an hour. We got 25 minutes left, but the, the your chapter one in your book. So I, first of all, I want people to know you have a hundred books, but this is your latest and it's your memoir, a hell of a life in hockey. And I bought a copy and I gave a copy to my father-in-law, probably going to give a copy to my dad. Like it's a great book. It's so I just want, I, I want to read a little tiny bit from the beginning. And you say in writing this rambling memoir, I came to one conclusion. Today's generation of NHLers are bigger, faster, and certainly far wealthier than those I knew in the past. They all appear to be well-dressed, well-behaved and well-mannered. Awesomely rich and handsome. They have stunning girlfriends and or wives. Did they all come out of some giant hockey cookie, cu cookie cutter? Looks like it. Where are the characters? And I'll name a few. Tiger Williams, Derek Sanderson, and then you go on and on. And then you say, I miss the guys who acted out, broke curfews, played hung hangover, hungover, uh, played hungover, got in scraps, jumped to the WHA, gave us memorable stories. And... I, I love that intro. Like it sets it up nicely. But now I want to talk about some of those people, some of those characters. Okay. So you've seen, first of all, just before we do, you've seen a big change in the players over those years, right? It's like. Yes, I have. But, you know, I might write that differently now. That's two or three years ago. I wrote that. I, I was saying to my wife the other day, <clears throat> excuse me. I watched two or three hockey games this week and two or three NFL games and I didn't enjoy any of them. Yeah. Oh. The players didn't seem to be putting out 100%. It was slower than it seemed uh, last year, a year or two ago. Uh, it was dull. There was not, I, I could tune in, as I did last night with the Leaf game, I tuned in for the last of the shootout. The only thing I saw on my screen last night was them all patting Campbell on the back after he left the rink. And I said, Oh, I guess the game's over. That's how much my attention span is directed. I'd rather be sitting here writing something. Uh, right. and, and I'm I'm worried about that because I think hope I hope everybody doesn't feel that way. Obviously, Leafs Nation is never going to change. Yeah. But the NFL, they should be ashamed of themselves, some of those players. 
they chase a guy downfield, but they give up after a 10 yard. They know they're gonna not gonna catch him, but they should they should exert all the energy they have in an effort. And yeah. uh, I don't see them doing that. I see them laughing on the bench and taking things. And these guys are making some of them thirty million dollars a year. Um, and they're just not playing as hard. So uh, I do have my beefs about major league sports. And uh, I even watched the tennis the other night thinking I might get more excitement out of that. There. There. <laughs> so, no, so, so some of the, uh, that that's disappointing. I wonder if COVID has affected, affected things. The whole I, world's I, different the last two years. I think it has affected all of us. And I tell myself we are so lucky to have a little place of our own where I can walk up and down 50 feet and get my steps in for the day. It's totally isolated. We're okay. We can get to the grocery store. We can have a good night's sleep. There are so many people suffering in the world today. Uh -huh. And what's going on in the U.S., for God's sake, they've got to get their act together. And the sooner the better. That's just disgraceful what's going on. So I could start anywhere with 15 different issues that they're dealing with. And I, and I think poor Biden, how does he ever yeah. survive yeah. Uh, all these things falling in on him one after the other and no cooperation? And uh, there's the pandemic, there's the Ukraine situation, yeah. there's schools and masking oh. and people are pro truck drivers are coming out oh. without a protest a mandate oh. where they have to get an injection for god's so, sake so brian mcfarland is 90 years old and he's keeping up on the news i always thought by the time i got to 90 i'd stop uh, reading the news but apparently that doesn't <laughs> happen but uh, i wonder if i can just have a game with you a little with brian because again as a kid growing up in northern ontario and my friend Alan asked if you were born in Sault Ste. Marie, but you weren't. You were born in Capus Casing or New Liskard? Uh, or New Liskard. New Liskard, yeah. <laughs> yep. So I just want to throw some names out here, if you wouldn't mind, and just give me a quick idea, some impression as to what – these are names that we they, – they weren't big names back in the day, but they they remained in my tiny little brain here for 70 years, and, they, you know, they were my heroes at the time. For example, Reggie Fleming. Yeah, I know Reg. Uh uh, Reggie Fem, you know, I'll tell you a Dick Irvin story. Dick, uh, I hired Dick as my assistant as a sportscaster in Montreal when we were together there. And uh, he went to the forum to a, he was a, a, a worker at the forum, actually, he was a timekeeper or whatever. And he went down there and two big guys assaulted him. We heard what you said with our brother Dredge the other night. You said he. Uh, believe it or not, he scored a goal for the Blackhawks. And Dick's protest, he's, I never said that. That was McFarlane. He said, you, you don't beat me up. Beat him up when he comes down here. <laughs> so I guess I, I said something that uh, Reggie's brothers were a little upset about. Uh, Reggie was more interested. He, anytime we had him on camera, he'd tell me, you know, I was on camera two years ago and I never got the $25 they promised me. Can you fix that for me? And I said, Reggie. <laughs> Reggie, that's not in my domain. <laughs> I don't know why you didn't get paid. Take it okay. up with somebody else. <laughs> How about this name? How about Bert Olmsted? I didn't get to know Bert very well, but Billy Harris told me when the Leafs won the Stanley Cup in 67, and my wife and I were at the game, I was doing it. She was spectating, and I think we may grow old enough to be the only two persons who were live at that event. But Billy Harris said, if we don't get Bert Olmsted from Montreal, we don't win those Stanley Cups in the 60s. He was uh, such a big fan of Bert Olmsted. And he said, you know, Punch traded him away uh, uh, in 67, I guess it was. And he said, because he was afraid the Leafs were going to hire Bert Olmsted as their next coach and fire Rimlack. <laughs> But Bert, uh, uh, Alan Stanley was the mainstay in those years too, wasn't he? The yeah, old snowshoes. They didn't. They thought he was finished in New York. They thought he was finished in Boston. Punch him like grabbed him for the Leafs, and he had about four or five really good years. He could head somebody off and steer them into the corner without having to be fast. Um, 
I, he, yeah, they had a really good defense with Armstrong and Horton and Bond and Carl Brewer oh. was one of my favorites. And he was the only guy that had ever been in my house that played in the NHL for a long time. And he was supportive of me. He would tell me, I, I read that book you wrote. It was really good. I heard your telecast the other night. That was good what you said about Keon. Um, I, I really appreciated Carl Brewer. Um, and an odd thing happened. He came to my house to return a manuscript I'd had him read. And it was a Friday afternoon, and we have a nice country place. And we were headed out before the traffic if we could. But Carl was there when I walked into my kitchen sitting having a coffee with my wife and we sat down for the next four hours and talked and he said i thought you guys wanted to go to the country and we said carl this is more important you're talking about mortality and your career and a bunch of subjects that we'd never touch on the next morning at 7 a.m the phone rings brian it's sue foster carl died in the night and oh talk about a shock. He had Ooh. sleep apnea and he was wearing a device. And she said, we get up at three o'clock to have a cup of tea. And he said, I'm not going to wear that device anymore. And he put it aside and he slept in. And she said, I went up and he was dead in bed. And I, that death affected me like Bob Golden's did when Ellie phoned one morning to say Bob passed away. I just sat there and the tears came down and uh, I realized there's some really nice people in hockey and Golden was certainly one and Carl Brewer was another and Ted Lindsay, when he passed away, I had those same emotions and Belleville, there, there's so many good people in the game and a few not so good, but that's okay. That goes with living. Wow. That story. I, you, I got chills just hearing it that yeah. you talked that he wanted to talk about stuff and you talked for so long that night. Yeah. That's a great story. Um, can I ask about a couple people as well, Duncan, or did I interrupt you? Do you no, have more? No, you ahead, ahead. This, yeah. this is our first show, Brian. We haven't figured, we haven't figured out exactly how we do yeah, this I, yet. I could tell. <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> we're starting at the top in terms of special guests, though. Uh, we are. We're starting. You're, yeah. you're number one, pal. And Duncan did tell me I could only speak three times the whole show, but you yeah, know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you might not get an Emmy this year, uh, but. You know, we'll keep working on it. No, I wanted to ask you about a couple. Um, Daryl Sittler, I don't know if you know this, but he does this thing called cameos where you can pay him like a hundred bucks and he'll send you a birthday greeting or whatever. And we got one from my father for when he turned 75 in December. And it was one of the kindest, sweetest messages. Like he went on and on much longer than he had to. And I know that you know him and you wrote, you worked on his book with him, Sittler at Center. So I was just wondering, what's Daryl Sittler like as a guy? Because he seemed very kind. Oh, he's a great ambassador for the Leafs. Uh, he, he got me fired, of course, because when he didn't show up for a game in Minnesota one night, we had a panel discussion about Daryl should have been here. Oh, what's wrong with him? I said, guys, I got to take the other side. A guy has a right to take a night off if he's having emotional problems, if he's sick, if his doctor says you better stay home, I don't want you playing hockey for a night or two. And that's what the case was. So in a mealy mouth way, I guess, I defended Sittler's right not to show up for that game. I was fired immediately right after the game. Uh, oh, no, actually, the next day when I got back, because Danny Gallivan and I flew back together, and he was on the panel. And he said, I think you're in trouble when you get home. Don't take the phone off the hook. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I took goodness. it off the hook, and I was gone. They said, Ballard wants you out of that building. You'll never get back there as long as you live. Well, that wasn't quite true, because... Uh, I did a couple of openings from outside the gardens. He couldn't buy oh. me from the sidewalk. <laughs> and and I, I was doing this opening. It would be October early in the year. And, and a couple of guys were standing there watching this this taping of the intro. One of them said, who's that guy? And he said, that's McFarland. Yeah, he's, he's, he can't get in the building. They won't let him in the building. He's banned. <laughs> he's, he's, 
he's going to get friggin' cold out here in February doing this. <laughs> and we got a laugh out of that. But, <laughs> that's great. Uh, that's all in the game. Yeah. yeah. Now there were, I, I do, I, I'll give you just uh, two more names. I, I looked it up. You've actually been on the ice and probably, I assume not a lot of people can say they've shared the ice with Jean Beliveau, who you already mentioned, but also Gordy Howe and Wayne Gretzky when he was only 12. So yes. just any, how did, how did the Gretzky thing happen? And well, what about Gordy Howe? The NHL old timers needed an extra player one night and they asked me to fill in. Well, I wouldn't go away. I mean, they needed them <laughs> the next Sunday in some Collingwood game or where fundraisers. I stayed for the next 20 years. I got a chance to play right wing for Normie Allman and Andy Bathgate. And there's Big M over there feeding me passes that I'm fumbling because I'm nervous. And he came over and he said, which team are you playing for? Uh, anyway, that was the start of it. And I made wonderful friends with the old timers, Wally, Stanowski, Golden. Oh, there were so many good ones. Sid Smith. Um, anyway, we played a game in Hamilton or Stony Creek. I can't remember which. And this little kid skated out with his legs churning. And I went right over the bench and I said, Art, to, to Art Smith, Sid's brother, the coach, Art, that's the Gretzky kid. He said, what? I said, he's the Gretzky kid from the Pee Wee tournament in Quebec. They say he's going to be a wonderful hockey player someday. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard of him. And he hadn't, and few people had. But I saw him go around Andy Bathgate and score a couple of goals. And I don't know whether to this day, whether Andy let him go around or not. I, maybe it was a little bit of both. But I met his father that day, Walter, for the first time. Okay, yeah. And Walter was always amazed when 20 years later I could say, I remember that first night I met your son, Walter, and I met his coach, Ron St. Amand. And he said, how would you remember his coach's name? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he went around the room and Cal Gardner looked up at him and said, Kid, keep your head up. That way you won't miss all the broads at rinkside. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, well, Cal, knock that stuff off. He's just, a, you know. Um, wow. So I remember that night, and uh, I don't know why I remember those things, because I can't remember people's names anymore. Uh, your, uh, your, but, your, your, your memory is amazing, Brian. Yeah. Who, who else did you mention, Charlie? I mentioned uh, Gordy Howe. Oh, Gordy. Wow, he used to go by us at the rink in Toronto when I'd have my nice blue jacket on, got my hair combed, uh, and I'm ready to interview, let's say, Punch Imlet. And yeah. Gordy would scoop up some snow on the blade of his stick and go by and hit the glass right on the top so the snow would fly all over a scrappy <laughs> snow from the rink. And he thought that was pretty damn funny. Um, uh -huh. But... Um, Gordy, in a game, I found myself out there. There was just Gordy and me. And he's got the puck in his own zone, and he's circling to come up. And he sees me there, and I'm saying, oh, my God, he's going to make a fool of me right now in front of all these 12,000 people. Yeah. And sure enough, he just gave me a little deke and went around me, and I'm going, where did he go? Which And and uh, I, I can't forget that either. Wow. Uh, they, they were good people, all of those old timers. So Fergie, I had to play off against Fergie at the Montreal Forum next to wow. him and facing off right next to him. And I, I knew Fergie. We'd owned a lacrosse team in Montreal, and he was my manager coach. And I said, Fergie, take it, take it easy on an old man. I'm not, I'm not in shape anymore. <laughs> and he didn't say anything. He just gave me a look. And I said, my God, that look, it meant it said it all. Just don't get in my way, McFarlane, and you may be okay. And I didn't I didn't get in his way. <laughs> we could we could go on all night. Uh, didn't I tell you, Charlie? Didn't I tell you? Oh, I know. And I'm, I'm sitting here going, okay, there's three yeah. more things I need to ask. And we only have seven <laughs> minutes. Well, if we end in an hour. I Anyway, Duncan, did you want to say something? I want to ask. Like, no, I'll, I'm just, I'll, I was just going to wind it down and so we could okay. sort of have well, a I just, at the end. You also, you wrote a song, like, uh, clear the track for Eddie Shack. <laughs> like, yeah. we have a couple, yeah, we have a I couple seconds it? of it. Here, can just a second, we're going to play that. Let me see if I can find it here. Uh, uh, here we go. Clear the track. 
And here comes Shaq He knocks him down and he gives him a whack He can score goals, he's coming back Eddie, Eddie Shaq They call him the great entertainer But ah, oh boy, Eddie's no clown It couldn't be made any plainer It's great to have Eddie in town Okay. You yeah, uh, went to number uh, one in Toronto, I heard, and in, in the year I was born, 66. Anyway, tell us about that. I'll try to keep this short, okay? Um, Eddie was doing well with the Leafs, and I said, uh, Johnny Bauer had a, sh- a song out, uh, Honky the Goose, but he was singing on it and getting royalties. So I said to Eddie, can I write a song about you? He said, I don't give a what you do. <laughs> So that was, to me, was permission. So I I wrote the words. I don't know anything about music, but my brother-in-law has his doctorate in music. So I went to Bill and I said, can you write a song for me together? And we did. In 20 minutes, we had the song done. Well, we recorded it. And I, I he said, my brother-in-law said, well, who's, who, who are the musicians? And I said, I don't know. I, I saw a guy, uh, four people playing at the press club the other night, The Secrets. They sounded okay to me, so I told them if they wanted to record it, we could probably fit them in. So he's he listened and he's Jesus Brian, they're not very good. <laughs> I said, well, what, what would I know about that? I said I already told them we could record it. So he said, well, let's try it. So the the secrets recorded the song and they immediately regretted it, saying it ruined their re- re- reputations, <laughs> and they changed their name to the Quiet Jungle and grew long beards and were never heard of again. <laughs> the song goes to number one for about eight weeks. I don't know. And now Shady, Eddie Shack comes to me. Where's my money? What money? Royalties. You're going to got to be making a fortune on that song. Give me my money. I said, Eddie, you don't get any money. You gave me permission to do it. You're not singing on the song. I'm not even getting any money. I don't know where the royalties are going. So anyway, well, give me a lot of free records then, which I did. <laughs> so anyway, for the next 30 years, he harasses me at banquets. Folks, that cheap SOB at the table there, he never paid me for that song, and it went to them. And he just he just blistered me every time. So I we're going to play an old-timers tournament in Victoria, and we're flying out to Vancouver, and the, we've got all these 20 NHL old-timers on the plane, and, the, it, and then he gives it to me on the plane, all the people on the plane – uh, he points me out. You see that cheap SOB sitting over there? He still, folks, he owes me money. <laughs> we get to the carousel. Now the bags are coming down, and I'm saying, I got to be out here all weekend with that so and so. I called him over. I said, Eddie, come here for a minute. What is it? And nose to nose, his nose was bigger. <laughs> I told him every vile comment, every vile word I'd ever heard just came flowing out of me and I thrust it all in his face one after the other. And Bob Golden nudged me and he said, I guess he, you know, he knows how you feel about him now. Uh, so that, and we ruined his weekend, not mine. And I said, I'll cut you to with an introduction tomorrow night at the Howie Meeker banquet that'll blah, 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 blah. And anyway, I, I gave him a good introduction, but I sure ruined his weekend. And uh, and I was glad I did that because all of a sudden uh, the, the garbage he was throwing at me stopped. And I never did get any royalties. I don't know why. And, but I did call the Musicians Union years later, 20 years later. And I said, you know, we did that song. and never, oh, Miss McFarland, far too late for that now. We couldn't track that down. But would you take a thousand dollars? And I said, sure. And he's, they sent me a check for a thousand dollars. And now we're at Dennis Hall's corn roast the next Saturday, and there's Eddie Shack. I said, I'm not going to tell him I got. <laughs> yes, I am. I called him over and I said, Eddie, I want you to see this check. I just got it, and it's for a thousand dollars for that stupid song I wrote about you, and you're not getting a penny of it. And he <laughs> he he burst out laughing. <laughs> to his credit, That's and shook funny. my hand. Congratulations, he said. That's great. Hey, see, I love that. Sorry, you go ahead, Duncan. No, I was just going to – go ahead, Trev. Well, I was I was going to ask if anybody had questions or if we are going to yeah, do that. There, are we out of time? Yeah, no, I, I, yeah it's just uh, 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 my friend Alan in PEI wants to know if you knew Todd Sloan. If, if you knew Todd Sloan. 
Oh, I knew him. I knew Todd, but not well. Um, I would see him occasionally at old timers luncheons. And uh, uh, I, I know the other guys spoke very well of Todd. And uh, he's, he's one of the guys I wished I'd got to know him better. And there's a whole lot of those. Yeah. I, I really, there's so many guys I, I'd like to have known a lot better there's, than I did. There's an old friend of yours, I think, from Crystal Beach saying, wanted to say hello. Uh, Roy Greer says to say hello. Roy oh. Greer. Okay, good. Yeah. 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 Um, we're, 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 I, my my father-in-law had a question, and then I'll shut up, Duncan. This will be my last one. Were you there when the, when the Maple Leafs won the last uh, Stanley Cup in 67? I was indeed. You were yes. there that night. Okay. And uh, Bill and I were in the gondola. Foster Hewitt was right next to to us doing the radio show. And uh, I remember it vividly. My wife was there. And as I say, we crashed the party afterwards. But let me talk about the ending of that game where Imlac did an amazing thing. He put all his old guys, the oldest guys he had, Stanley and, and, and Bauer was out. No, Bauer was hurt. Sawchuck in goal, Pulford. Um, Red Kelly at center. Um, no, he didn't center that face off. Stanley took the face off. Can you believe he hadn't taken a face off in weeks or months? And he's, I never take a face off. I just run into the guy ahead of me and it's total <laughs> interference. And that's what he did that night, but he wasn't called for it. And the puck went to Pulford up to George Armstrong, right wing, empty net goal. And uh, the Leafs pretty much cemented it with that. After the game, we go home with a, a CBC director whose name escapes me. And we're sitting around having a drink of beer or whatever at the ta kitchen table. And I said, damn it, we should be at the victory party. It's over at Staff Smythe's house. And, and let's go. So we said, okay. We jump in a car. And I said, where's Staff Smythe's house? I don't know where. But the guy did. It was with us, apparently, because we got there. And we walked in, and the Stanley Cup was there. We walked into the foyer. We, nobody to greet us, just walked right in the door. And we enjoyed the party for the next hour. And the guys, the players were dancing, and the music, and the drinking, and the shouting. And, and it was a revelation. I was so glad we did that. We stayed about an hour and went home. But uh, wow. it, it was one thing we did that I, I'm glad we did. What an amazing memory. That's great. Duncan, I'm going to shut up now. No, but I could just, talk to Brian. I could talk to Brian for you know, yeah, I could do no, three or well, four hours. Yeah, no, that's the thing. Well, you know, when he publishes his 120th book, we'll bring him back, and uh, and we'll we'll be on you know probably our thousandth episode at that point in time. I was going to say we'll know what we're doing by then too. Yeah, we're going to be. Uh, <laughs> you you just watch us, Brian. This this is a broadcast that's going to make. A hockey night in Canada looked pretty pathetic at the end of the day, but you well, just having you here has really been a. It's always a thrill to talk to you, and I look forward to another coffee up at the local coffee shop uh, where you live. And uh, you're in my small circle of friends, yeah. Duncan, and you always will be, I'm sure. Thank and you. Charlie, welcome to that circle too. Uh, I'd be friend. glad to come on anytime. I'm uh, I'm flattered that you thought of me, especially for your introductory show. And and uh, there's so many great hockey people that you probably thought of and or musicians. Um, yeah, yeah. No, we've got a lot of friends that uh, next week's show is going to be great too, and we'll talk about that in a second. But well, yeah. um, I okay. just wanted to say, hard, hard to compete with you in your career there, Brian. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. amazing. Well, keep that Eddie Shack song going. We might get some royalties someday <laughs> from that. I'm going to learn from, it. Or from Peter Puck, or who knows? Yeah, we might get wealthy yet. Anyway, okay. guys, I'll say good night then, and thank you again. Give us a call, Dunk, one day soon when we're you ready bet. to go to Tim Hortons or whatever. You bet. Thanks, Brian. It's okay, so nice bye -bye. to meet you. Bye bye. Well, Duncan, wow. wow, there we are, our first show. Wow. So that was amazing. He's so. I, you were right. He's fascinating to talk to, and yeah, I could have talked. As you know. Yeah. I worked on a script that was like five pages long. I don't even think we got to a quarter of it. <laughs> no, I've, I've been glancing at it throughout the show, and it's uh, no, never got to much of it. But we no. do have a, another special guest next month. We haven't got a date yet, but because uh, he's a, a busy guy, have guitar will travel. My new pal Bill Culp, uh, big time tribute show producer, but a lifetime musician. Uh, one of these guys, Charlie, and I always admire those that make shit happen and this guy he doesn't sit around 
he makes shit happen. And I always ride on their coattails. So I hope in the future I'll be riding on some of Bill's coattails. And maybe maybe uh, he'll ride on our coattails as we talk about his new book. He's living in uh, Cape Breton right now, but I think uh, for the most part he was in central Canada, but the COVID has drove, driven him home. So, uh, so we'll, if you watch our websites, or we'll, we'll let everybody know. Uh, yeah. when the when the next show will be well and i was just going to say our show we we even had we weren't sure of the title you came up with chuck and dunk and i was like well nobody calls me chuck i'm really charlie but i like it so we went with chuck and dunk and i joked and said blah 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 but then when you just said make shit happen that could be chuck and dunk make shit, make happen. shit happen maybe yeah. that's it who knows maybe. although brian did you notice when brian was telling a story today he went blah 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 at one point i thought we should get every guest to do that at least once during the show <laughs> I like it because it's exactly what our, our wives think when we open our mouths. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's what it is. So in terms of just plugging ourselves, you have a book about Stomp and Tom. Yes. You, and I've written, in case people are interested, because that's we kind of do this in the hopes that people might read our work and stuff too. Yours is a wonderful book called My Good Times with Stomp and Tom which I, I actually read and I, I use bits of it. When I wrote my, I have a biography about Stomp and Tom called Stomp and Tom Connors, The Myth and the Man. And I also wrote one about Rita McNeil. I'm working on my third now. This one's called I'm Not What I Seem. Mine are available in bookstores, Kohl's, Chapters and stuff. Or check out my website, charlierindress.com. And how do people find out more about you? What's your website, Duncan? Uh, well, first first of all, shameless self-promotion is the name of the game as far as I'm concerned. Maybe the next... Maybe the next uh, the next show, I'll play a video of a song I wrote called "Take a CD Home Tonight" that I played all my shows, and and oh, I, I make no excuses for the yeah. shameless approach I take to marketing my books and my CDs, and because we're all salespeople at the end of the day, right? Well, Whether if I had a manager, they could do that. I don't. Yeah. It's just me, so I got to yeah. promote myself. So, exactly. <laughs> and Brian also has a website in case people. And I put is, it I, on the screen. It was uh, oh, okay, it was great. The, yeah, so so and they can, can always it. they can always message us uh, with anything you know. So I think that's it. We're going to be yeah. back in a month or so, the end of yeah. February. Thanks to all, all of the YouTube people and all the Facebook people. And eventually we'll have people from around the world clamoring to uh, sign on. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for asking me to do this, Duncan. It's been fun hanging with you again, yeah, as always. Thanks, Charlie. Bye. Bye. Bye.